Marty, Marty, you're already there. So good. Um, Y'all, welcome back to Shasta's Table Topics. It is the third season. That means that we've been celebrating people for three seasons, including during the pandemic. So thank y'all all. Give yourselves a hand for just shouting out all your colleagues and really thinking about all the hard work that everyone is doing on behalf of students. So for those of you joining us for the first time, these table topics allow us the opportunity to get to know each other, have some candid conversations, get all in your business, but understand who is the person behind the work. We spend so much time working hard for our students that we don't take a break just to say, who are you? You love what you do, but there's a family. There are friends behind the work that you do. So I hope today in season three, episode one of season three, we get an opportunity to learn a little bit more about our colleagues. So a lot has happened since season one and two. We have a landing page. Give it up, shout outs for the operations and communications team doing all that great work. So if you miss any episodes and want to see other student affairs champions, see what they've shared or nominate a next spotlight or a department, go on to that website at austincc.edu backslash table topics. Not shasting and there's just table topics, all one word. We also have a LinkedIn page. How many people are on LinkedIn? Okay, we need to see your, we need to see your energy on LinkedIn. I know there's some faces in here that's always on LinkedIn, always posting. So I want to see y'all post, talk, share, reshare, repost. Let's get that energy going for all the hard work that everyone does. And so today, though, as I walk up on the stage, we are going to be highlighting our first ever video producer, Morty Ortega. Give him a hand. And we are also going to have the opportunity to get to hear from our student um, SIS core team. They're doing some amazing work. Give them a hand. And you know, we're going to get an update from our culture team and new employee onboarding and student affairs because, you know, once you get your benefits set up and you learn a lot from HR, we want to make sure that you're welcomed into the family of student affairs. That sound OK for y'all? All right, give them a hand. So without further ado, I want to introduce Morty a little bit. Is that okay? So I hope I'm not stealing any, any of your thunder when you get ready to kind of answer some questions. Because again, I'm about to get all in this business. So Morty Ortega is a bicultural video producer born in Chile and raised in the United States. His life as a photojournalist and journalism instructor has taken him from covering the Civil War in the jungles of Myanmar to Mayan villages in Yucatan, Mexico. His personal highlight is when he worked for the government of Chile's press office to photograph the rescue of the 33 miners in 2010. I know, that's what I said. I was like, we got a lot to talk about, Morty. So why don't we get into it? You ready? Let's do this. All right, all right, let's do it. All right, all right, all right. So Morty, I've heard so many great things about you and some of your exciting background as a photojournalist. Can you recount a little of that and share more of who you are with us? What were some of your experiences that have shaped who you are today? Sure. Um, so I guess my journey as a photographer really began when I graduated from uh, my undergrad at, at the University of Connecticut in Yukon. And I um, moved to um, Patagonia, uh, to Chile. Next slide. And there you can see me at work and some of the pictures that I've taken there. Um, and so I, one of the things that I really wanted to do was become a storyteller of sorts, yeah. you know, using images. Yeah. and photos, and a sort of a big marking, like a big event that happened to me was, um, that I experienced personally, was the 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake we had in 2010 mm -hmm. um, in Chile. And <clears throat> as you can see there, that's a 16-story that's a, um, building that's been toppled sideways. So those are the floors just horizontally there. Wow. Um, and triangles are the safest shape so that's how the rescuers cut in there to, to get in and rescue people. Um, fortunately, Chile, because we are so earthquake prone, we, our buildings are designed very well. And this was one of the few buildings that, that fell. Um, but it was a really interesting experience because 
you know, I was living in the south of Chile, and the earthquake happened, stuff started knocking around, yeah. the house was, you know, shaking, creaking. I, I was in the second story of a wooden house, so I thought the whole thing was going to come crashing down. Wow. And so the next morning, once we got electricity and cell phone service back and the water and everything, all the utilities came back, I was able to talk to my um, mentor, Hugo Infante who had been a war photographer in Iraq. He was uh, based out of um, Santiago in Chile, in the capital. And I asked him, I was like, where is the epicenter of this? I want to go cover this story. And when I was living in Chile, I didn't own a car. Um, public transportation is great, so we, so I, got, I was able to get around like, pretty easily using buses and taxis and all sorts of things. Hold on, did y'all catch that only Morty was running to the epicenter? Of where the earth, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so I took several buses to get up to the epicenter in Concepcion. And uh, yeah, you're, as you're saying, you know, a lot of people were leaving or trying to get out, finding ways to get out. So y'all were going in the opposite direction. And I arrived on the last bus that arrived in there, yeah. in the city. At night, there was a military curfew. So if you were found on the, on the streets, you were in big trouble. Uh -huh. um, so that night I actually slept with some firefighters, like they had emptied their fire station out onto the street mm -hmm. and um, because their fire station was crumbling. So mm -hmm. they had all these like mattresses on the street. I was like, hey, can I sleep here, you know, until I can get to the press office and get myself a credential so I don't get arrested. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what I did and I lasted about a week, um, but because I didn't have a car, I didn't have any place to store food, I didn't have a place to recharge my laptop, my camera. So I, I ran out of batteries personally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I got out of there, but I was able to submit a lot of images uh, working for Polaris, uh, Polaris Images, um, which is an agency based out of New York. Wow. So there you can see some of the devastation. And because Chile is this long, narrow country alongside the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, when we have an earthquake, there's always a tsunami that happens. Mm -hmm. So you would see, um, you can't see it in this image, but a lot of this is like where the ocean came in. Mm. There were these 60 ton fishing boats that were about a mile uh, wow. inland because the ocean had just like taken them in. So then, next slide. Uh, the other sort of highlight that, that's mentioned uh, in my bio is being able to cover the uh, Chilean miners uh, rescue story. and. This is actually also in 2010, in October. Mm -hmm. So it was a big year for me. Busy, huh? Mm -hmm. Very busy. Mm -hmm. So every day that I watched like the media circus, like you know, when so the, from the when the miners were found alive to like the sort of preparations that happened in in between the 69 days that they were underground, um, I kept watching the news and kept watching more and more journalists arrive at the scene until there were about 1,400. That's what you see in the picture there on the left. Uh, is Camp Hope, which is 1,400 journalists wow. and some of the families from the, from the miners that were waiting their, their, um, their loved ones to come out. And then the other photo you see, um, sort of the corral of the, where the press was kept out. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened was my, working with my uh, mentor, Uwe Infante, uh, he, we had had a lot of contracts with his photo agency to work with the government of Chile. Mm -hmm. And so about a week before the rescue happened, we were both like debating, do we go cover the story? Aren't there too many journalists there? How, what are we going to, what story are we going to contribute? Mm -hmm. Right? So, uh, he gets a, he gets a call from the government press office a week before and he says, we're going to hire you to be one of the four photographers there on the wow. ground, like at the rescue site, not a half mile away where the press is, like at the site. Wow. And he said, sure, under one condition, I take an English speaking photographer with me to help serve as backup. And that was me. Uh. So it was me and Uvo, and then two uh, presidential photographers who were, you know, at the site where the, where the men were being taken out. So if you move on, you can see there, that's the, the, the part that says, Guillermo de Chile, that's the Chilean president. Yeah. And then that's one of my photos that was published in the New York Times. Um, that's amazing. Of a, uh, he was, this, this minor was actually a famous um, soccer player, and that's his daughter who was receiving Aww. him. Very touching moment. So, and, uh, so that was just an amazing experience. I, I barely remember any details of it because it was 72 hours mm. long, the whole um, mm -hmm. ordeal. And I was, you know, grabbing images from Ugo's card, 
uh, capturing them, uploading them to our servers, um, not getting any sleep because you know the faster this, the the more the miners they pulled out, the faster they pulled the operation. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so Morty. Yeah. So you rushed to the epicenter as everybody else was leaving. You made it right there, past where the press was being held for the miners. Help me understand how you got to ACC. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let me mention one other thing. Sure, okay, okay. but you're gonna tell me how you got to ACC? I will. Okay, okay, okay. After this. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, let me just touch upon a really quick uh, international uh, story that I was doing uh, during my graduate. Uh, I did a master's in journalism at the University of North Texas. Yeah, yeah. And so I was able to, um, I found out about this civil war that's been going on in the north of Burma or, my, or Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had happened to be in Thailand for a photo workshop mm -hmm. at that time. And so I had heard about this, this conflict that was going on and I had a writer friend of mine from the, uh, from the master's program mm -hmm. and we decided to cover the story. And so to get to this area, it was off limits. The Burmese government did not want foreigners in this area. There's only mm -hmm. two, at that time, there were only a few places in Burma where, where foreigners could go. Yeah. Um, and they were all in the south of Burma, not the north. So to get there, we kind of had to get in contact with a uh, local Kachin organization. This mm -hmm. is in Fort Worth. They mm -hmm. had a Baptist church. And so they were able to, able to hook us up with some of their contacts in Burma. And they said, you'll have to fly into an airport in China, and we'll smuggle you across the border. So that's what I did. <laughs> So we hopped onto all these different international flights, getting into the really small airport that was really close to the um, Burmese border. And we met a guy who barely spoke English, maybe five words of English. And we were able to uh, hop in his truck and uh, three or four hour ride later, at one point he says, Burma, China, Burma, China. And we finally understood that we had crossed the border. Uh -huh. And then we covered a lot of the um, the refugees, uh, internally displaced people that were forced out through the, you know, the violence of war that was happening. The, the Burmese government is uh, still ongoing mm -hmm. in conflict with, this, uh, with the Kachin people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's five different ethnic groups in, in, in Burma, and the Kachin have been at war with the central government since the creation of Burma. Um, so they're just fighting for their uh, independence, and, um, and a lot of these people get moved around. Unfortunately, so. So you ran to the epicenter. Yeah. <laughs> you were able to get close to the miners and other press couldn't. And to just put the cherry on top, you got smuggled into Burma. Unless there's one border I crossed. Oh. <laughs> but it was the smuggling you in and you were in the trunk. Yep. Did they leave it open a little bit so you could get some air? I was in the front seat, actually. Oh, okay. The guy oh, okay. thanked me, like, uh, in Burma, Burmese men wear a lungi, uh -huh. which is like a, um, like a dress for men, mm -hmm. like, yeah, a, yeah. like a sarong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I had to wear one of those and, like, wear some local clothes. And they said I could pass off as Burmese. I don't know how with my looks, but... Uh-huh. <laughs> so now are you going to tell me after all of this epicenter miners and smuggled in, mm -hmm. you're going to tell me how you got to ACC? Sure. All right. The... The news industry started drying up. You know, it's it's been a hard time for the for the um, for journalists yeah. uh, over the last ten years, 10, 20 years. The golden age of journalism is way long gone. Yeah. And so when I moved to Dallas after I married my my lovely wife, who's in the audience, raise your hand. We want to see you. <laughs> we were in Dallas for a little bit, and I was uh, teaching photojournalism at uh, Eastfield College, uh, Dallas Community College. My mother used to work there. How wonderful. Yeah. Mm. So I taught there for a year, um, part-time, and tried to do some freelance assignments and work with some photo agencies. And I, I was like, I need benefits. I need something stable, <laughs> you know, we want that. So um, I gradually made my way to a higher ed uh, video production. And mm -hmm. uh, I got a job at Baylor where, I've been for the la where I had been for the last five years. And really used that, that storytelling ability that journalists have yeah. to pivot to higher ed marketing, which is where we're telling stories of the students. Yeah, so talk to us a little bit about your work in student affairs communications and how it enhances student success. Mm -hmm. So what are the challenges too um, that you might wanna share that you face in your job now? So I'll, I have a little highlight reel that oh, we, can, cool. we can start on. So 
so that's just a few of the things that I've been cover, able to cover within the last 10 months since I've started work here at ACC. Um, wow. And it's really about like uh, lifting that student voice and, and having them be seen, validating yeah. them. You know, yeah. it's so important for students to, to, um, to be seen in the, in the marketing and for, the, you know, for a lot of like peer-to-peer -peer sort of marketing. Rather than using the institutional voice, it's, it's really important for students to know, you know, how, the ways that they can succeed um, but in the voices of other students. You know, it's interesting that you talk about the stories because if y'all think about just everything that Morty has shared, I don't know if y'all felt like drawn, like it was this cliffhanger, so what happened next? I can see how you, you the way you told the story and the experience and then just seeing that short clip um, of just your work here in 10 months. Raise your hand if you were a part of hiring Morty. I just would like to see you in that. Thank you, Steph. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. I just think, um, one, it's so amazing to meet you, but it's just as amazing to hear your story, your work, and just what you're passionate about. So what advice would you give students or other people that are looking at this particular field or industry as a career? What would you tell them? Like I've said so many times, it's really all about storytelling. We yeah. are hardwired, our brains are hardwired for story. If you're sitting on the edge of your seat, it's because our brains are releasing dop dopamine. You know, as we're listening to the story, we want to know what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next. And so really learn storytelling. Yeah, you can learn your cameras, you can learn your audio equipment, you can learn all this, but at the end of the day, the person who tells the best story is the one you're going to listen to. So are there any projects or initiatives that are taking place that we can look forward to seeing from Student Affairs, the video production? Yeah, there's a few. Uh, so oh. we're working with uh, Campus Real, which is a company that's gonna allow us to produce some videos uh, using sort of that day in the life selfie vlog style yeah. uh, from, for YouTube. And uh, we're gonna have like uh, a few students working on that to produce some campus tours, some 360 uh, campus tours. Oh, cool. And then as well, we also have the Bobar campaign, which is benefits of being a riverbed. Cool. It's where students can discover all these different ways that we have resources for them. I love everything about that. Our students often say, it, you have to have so many different ways to share the benefits of being here at ACC if you're a student. And so I think that Bobar, that benefits of being a riverbed is gonna be super exciting for our students. Okay, before I let you off the hook, yeah. and you better pick a, a good person in the audience to shout out. You can shout out anybody you want to, but you can't forget one. <laughs> okay, who would you like to shout out? I can't, it can't just be one. No, it can be it more can than be one, but you one better one. not mess up one of them. Oh, I know. Oh, okay. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely have to shout out my wife. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, she is a, um, uh, she works in student accessibility services, and she was the first one who was hired here at ACC, and she let me know that this is a wonderful place to work, and uh, it was pretty easy to choose, you know, this over Texas Parks and Wildlife, which is where I was a finalist for. Cool. So, yeah. I chose ACC. One of my strengths I've learned is competition, so I feel like we beat them <laughs> out, and I think it was well you worth did. it, so yes. But I, I also wouldn't be here without Stephanie. Yeah. My, my boss, my supervisor. Aww. Yeah. So you got your shout outs in? Yeah, that's it. All right, y'all, would you help me and do the great honor of thanking Morty and just celebrating him? This is an amazing story, and I look forward to working with you so much. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Next up is a student affairs department spotlight. I believe this is the SIS team. Is that who's coming up next? Come on and join me. All righty, let's see, who do I have on the stage with me this afternoon? So first what I wanna share is we have a great group. Um, this department plays a pivotal role and is dedicated to helping us navigate the massive transformation of our new SIS, our student information system, Workday Student. This ERP will empower our students to manage their own relationship with ACC from anywhere with any device. So who I have joining me this afternoon is Sarah Lizenby. She's our Director of Student Affairs Strategic Projects and Operations. We have Cam Clausen. 
Clawson. Uh, Workday SIS Process Analyst and Trainer, and Ariel Flores, our Workday SIS Process Analyst and Trainer. Would you please help me give them a round of applause for joining me this afternoon? So I told Kim I was going to do this, claw, because it was going to make me remember how to pronounce her name correctly. But I think we've come up with, that's kind of going to be your brand. So we can get them to do it at the end. OK, great. OK, great. All right, so Sarah, are you ready? I think I'm starting with you. Yeah. All right, mic check, one, two. So Sarah, could you give us a quick overview of the team, how it complements the work of the college for Workday students? And can you give us some exciting updates on what has been accomplished to date? Why, I sure can. Um, actually, this is an amazing team. It's a, it's a powerhouse of individuals. They're actually in the audience today, the rest of the team. So raise your hand, team. Raise your hand. I just want y'all to know they show up everywhere in full force, OK? <laughs> OK. Like I said, powerhouse, a force of powerhouse. Um, so yeah, we have a brilliant group of individuals who are working with our various student affairs departments to understand the work that y'all do to support our students so that we can make sure that when we do implement this new technology, that work continues and it improves with the technology. So um, in terms of updates, wow, we've done so much, I don't even know where to begin. But um, <laughs> probably some of the biggest things to um, keep your eyes out for is we have some road shows coming up, which is where we'll be visiting campuses. And we are going to be visiting General Assembly. And we have launched a newsletter, a website. We've done, I mean, we've done a lot, Shasta. So. Oh, yeah. well. I don't, well, did I miss anything, y'all? The email. Which email? We have an email. Isn't that the newsletter? And they have an email. We, we do email. have an email. <laughs> And they have an email. We have a lot of things. Email, text. You can beep us on if you have a beeper. You know, we we, we want to be available to y'all. We're here to serve you. So when you think about all the work that the SIS team is doing, Cam, what are you most excited about with Workday Student and the transition? Well, I have two answers. Oh, uh, so let me the first one. Like um, okay, raise your hand if you've ever been working with a student and you try to get in their colleague record and you get a message that you can't get in because you're locked out. And then you it's have almost to very, everyone. very politely send a message to the person respectfully saying, get out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now question two, raise your hand if you've ever received the get out message because you're in a record. <laughs> yeah, that's not a problem in Workday Student anymore. So Anybody can look at a student record, any ACC employee, multiple employees at the same time. So it alleviates this issue that I feel like we've dealt with for decades. Oh. So it's not a problem anymore. Um, the second thing that I'm most excited for is I've been a student. I've been a student worker. I've been a frontline staff employee and I've been a non-student facing employee. Mm. And so I know the pain points that come with all of those areas. And from what I've seen with Workday Student, it seems like a lot of those pain points are alleviated for every group, not just one at the expense of the other. So the fact that it seems like everybody gets to benefit just makes my little, my little student affairs heart sing. So. <laughs> Ariel, so as a former student advising specialist, what is one thing you would share with your fellow advising colleagues about Workday Student when it comes to supporting our students in their academic journey? Yes. Okay. On. Well, there we go. All right, let's try this again. Okay, great. All right, so I am so incredibly excited for advising to see what is going to come with Workday Student. One of the things I'm very excited about is the efficiency that it's going to bring to our day-to-day -day tasks. Whenever I was in advising, I would start my day opening up at least five, six, seven, eight, sometimes different tabs to get the information I needed to help my students. And Workday Student, we're going to cut down on a lot of that. We're going to make sure it's streamlined. It's going to be more efficient. And by making these small day-to-day -day tasks more efficient, we are going to be able to spend more time with the student and meeting them where they're at, addressing their needs. That's what's most important when it comes to advising. We do so much more than pick classes, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, 
Um, and that is what I'm very excited for advising to see. I can't wait. So anyone share with us, what are some of the resources available to student affairs to stay informed about the project? I'll take that. Okay. So Sarah mentioned earlier, um, we do have a wonderful monthly newsletter that is going out once a month. I highly encourage everyone, please pay attention to all of it, but in particular, look at the word of the month. With Workday Student comes a totally new set of vocabulary for us. And one of the reasons we started including the word of the month is so, so that everyone could start getting comfortable with this new terminology. Um, we also have, of course, the road shows coming up. That is going to start in October. Please keep an eye out for more news regarding that. And as mentioned earlier, we're going to be at General Assembly. We're going to have a table. So please come see us. Please come talk to us. We're really looking forward to seeing everyone over there. Well, cool. So I think what's important about the word of the day or word of the month, um, word of the month is just to get used to it before we turn the switch on and go live so we can become familiar. So y'all, every opportunity you get, the roadshow experience to play with it. I heard y'all say the other day, break it or whatever it is. Yes. Yeah. So we're going to go into a testing period starting roughly next June, depending on how things play out. We're going to open up an invitation basically for you guys to come and break everything and absolutely destroy it if you can, because we need to know like what's bad about the system, what's good about it, what's painful so that we can actually deliver you something that works and not something that doesn't. And then you're frustrated, the students are frustrated. So when we open up these opportunities, take us up on it, engage, let us know how you feel. We can handle it, I promise. Hey, well, bye. So Sarah, maybe I kind of um, uh, jumped the gun and Cam did an amazing job of answering, but what and how can student affairs help us work towards this student modernization? Yeah, so the definitely participating in testing when that comes will be a huge help. Um, it will be vital to the success of the project. But beyond that, staying engaged with what we're doing. So we mentioned the word of the month, the newsletter. Don't wait until a week before we go live mm. to start to understand how this system works. We are putting things out um, at a regular cadence so that you can start ex being exposed to the terminology, to the interfaces, to the way this platform works versus our current legacy platform of Colleague, and take advantage of that. You can also stay engaged by um, participating in the road shows, coming to those when we have those, coming to General Assembly. Let us know other ways that we can uh, support you and how you want to be engaged because at the end of the day, we're only, how many people are we? Seven, eight for the entire Student Affairs Department. We will welcome different perspectives if you have ways that you would like us to reach out to y'all. Um, any way that we can um, bring you into this process, we want to. So please reach out to us often. Um, come find us wherever we're, whenever we're on campus, we want to talk to y'all. And I think it's important, important to reiterate, please don't wait till we turn it on one week before. Every opportunity, if you say, hey, I didn't get the newsletter to figure out what my word of the month is, tap your buddy on the shoulder and say, did you get the newsletter? So then we can make sure you get the newsletter too, okay? So let's make it go viral. Word of the month and also reading everything that comes because this is a tool for our teams to best support our students. And so we don't want you to miss the opportunity to be able to provide some valuable feedback to make sure it's the best that it can be for you and for the students that we serve. So before I let them off the hook, what shout outs do you all want to give? Who's going first? <laughs> I would like to give a shout out to the entire SIS core team who is here today. We made them raise their hands earlier. Thank you. Um, I would also like to send a shout out to our instructional SIS core team. Nice, good job. Collaboration. Collaboration. Who's next? Who's shouting out next? On top of all of those lovely people, also our leadership team who does a fantastic job of advocating when we have blockers to help us kind of work through any issues we're having, um, for providing us clear guidance on where we need to go, and for also giving us some woo when we need it. <laughs> we appreciate it. Anybody else to shout out? 
I want to shout out all of you, those of you who read the newsletters, who watch the videos, who submit the crossword puzzle. Yeah, you have a ch- we have gains in the newsletter. Oh, yeah, there's a gain. Uh, I make, I make thank you. Game. Thank you for being engaged with us. Thank you for joining the conversation and please continue to do so. Well, I have to say about our SIS team, one, it is a huge challenge. It's a huge job to do this and lead us as a department and as a college in this kind of transition. So one, I thank y'all so much for applying, raise your hand and saying, yes, I want to do this and then being prepared for the feedback because this is hard work that y'all have been involved in for so long. And so I just ask to all our colleagues, as you give that feedback, please do it with love because they put in a heart, sweat and tears into this to, to develop something with you in mind and to support you to the best of their ability. Please help me thank our SIS team, please. Great job. I got it. And it looks like it's time for a student affairs priority spotlight. Are they here? Do I see them? There they come. Won't y'all come up on the stage so y'all can get a big hand clap? Rocky. Yeah. That's not Yeah. And you just made that one. Took that one. Okay. All right. So for our student affairs priority spotlight, I want to share a little bit with that, um, about this team. Over the past academic year, our dedicated strike team has been creating a uniform onboarding framework for student affairs that ignites a sense of passion and purpose for our new and current employees. The strike team's primary outcome was to engage in candid dialogues with student affairs employees, discussing our current organizational culture, seeking insights on innovating the onboarding process for student affairs team. I think that's big. Before we can onboard you, let's talk about culture and the culture and who we want to be as a team and how we best support and show up for each other. So I want to be able to introduce you all to Anna Rummer, who's our Associate Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs Operations. I said Associate Vice Chancellor, right? You nailed it. Okay, in my mind, I said Vice President, but I meant, okay. I think it's age, it's age, I'm almost half a century old. Okay, uh, Jose Resendez, our Regional Director of Learning Support Services, and Dr. Deidre Albert Green, our Director of Online Learning Support and Embedded Services. Please give them a big old round of applause. <laughs> so let's see, Dr. Albert Green, I think you're first to my questions. As a strike team lead, could you share your personal experiences collaborating with the team to initiate changes that will impact all members of our division? Sure, I'd love to. Um, Just getting to know the team members, being introduced to them, it was a great group of people, first of all. Um, It kind of felt like the first day of school, uh, meeting everybody because everyone was anxious, a little anxious, and not knowing what to expect, but... Again, everyone kind of came together and we all just coalesced around a common goal. Um, One person that was pivotal in creating our fearless uh, culture tours uh, that helped train us was uh, Jenna McCarthy. We could have done it without her. Um, (laughs) And (laughs) we have our picture. We have Jenna here with us, Jana here with us today. Jenna's busy leading. Yes. In other capacities today. So, okay. We're not going to knock you down, Jana. Okay. Okay. But we were were definitely able to hear all of the employees that attended all of the sessions. And so we felt like we were able to meet our goal in that way. Very nice. So, Jose, can you elaborate on the key challenges you encountered while working on this strategy? and how the team overcame them. And I got a whole bunch of questions. And (laughs) were there any unexpected insights or discoveries that emerged during your conversations with employees about the current culture and onboarding experiences? So um, yes to both uh, of those. And as you can see on the the next slide, um, we ended up, uh, one of our biggest challenges in this and, and was capturing a complete picture of student affairs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we're we're a very big district. Every campus has its own flair. Um, I, I've had the pleasure of working at at least five of them, and and everyone is 
unique in their own way, but very welcoming and accepting. So the first thing we said, we, we said, we need to make sure we visit all. And so what that translated to was 26 visits all across ACC. Uh, we went to all the campuses multiple times, and that, led, that was about 80 hours of work that our, that our team put in. So, um, you know, I, again, great work from them. Did y'all hear the 80 hours of listening sessions? That's a lot of opinions. It, it is, um, <laughs> and, and very much worth it. Okay, yeah, yes, absolutely. I agree, um, yeah. So one of the, and so that was, that was the big challenge, but yeah. you know, our, our team definitely stepped up to it. Um, and then I think Anna can speak a little bit about some of the culture that we saw. Absolutely. I think one of the greatest things about this particular team is that they literally took this entire conversation from entry level all the way up to the executive team. So at our executive retreat, they got the same exact treatment that everybody else did across the district. They did the same stinky fish exercise. They did the same culture mapping. And I think what was really exciting for the team that was doing the facilitation was they realized a lot of the pain points that they were hearing from employees from front lines were very similar to the types of pain points that the administrators were sharing too. It was just a little in different ways. Um, it was also really cool to see whenever they did the scatter plot of where do you see our current workplace culture and where do you wanna see it going? Those were also very well aligned. Um, so I think that that was really promising and encouraging for the, the team who is facilitating these conversations. So Jose, I'm gonna kick it back to you. So what were some of the stories or highlights that came from the listening session, if you feel comfortable in sharing? Oh, absolutely, I do. Um, and, and the reason I feel comfortable is because the people that went felt comfortable sharing their, mm -hmm. those stories with us. Um, and I think on, we might have some on the next slide. See the hubs. Um, one of the, oh, I guess not. That's okay. Um, so some of the some of the key highlights that we saw, and you know, just as a team, one of the things going in, we were like, you know, we we know the types of questions that we're asking. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be. Uh, it might things might get tense. Uh, you know, emotions might run high. Um, but at the end of the day, we we ended up seeing certain, um, like like Anna said, certain commonalities. Um, for example, one of the things that that came from our frontline employees was. You know, they feel like they have a wealth of, of knowledge and expertise and, and they feel like that potential is not being fully used. Right. And so that was something that when we carried it over to uh, our managers and our directors, you know, they, they also felt and they also felt similar. They, they it was it was just a, from a different lens. So, you know, sometimes sometimes change just comes fast and, and we have to run with it. And so. You know, there, there's some of those pain points, but it, it comes down to having that support. And I think that um, that is something that was felt throughout our, our conversations. Uh -huh. So, Deidre, from the gathered feedback and suggestions from employees, do you see this initiative further improving the student affairs onboarding experience? And if so, how so? Yes, I, I definitely do. Um, as our initial goal was to try to figure out what the current culture is, and so like Jose and Anna uh, just mentioned, there are different flavors on every campus. So it was important for us to gather all of that and put it into one, one place where we all could see it. Um, so I think that from this point forward, after presenting to the executive leadership, um, we're going to pass it forward so we can make sure that we're able to hear what our employees were saying yeah. and we can act on it. Yeah, I think what was um, so real when you all did the session for um, the Student Affairs Council was, one, we had to have that moment when you see the scatter plot um, to process that and to own it and to recognize that this is truly how people feel. But in the moment and environment to be transparent and to be able to transition to who we want to be, it takes those moments sometimes that, I don't want to say break us, but um, opens our eyes and reveals what we already know to be true, but this is documented evidence that it is. But to Anna's point, they were also the feelings that we had as a council um, and how we feel in terms of those moments when you feel overwhelmed, overworked, and it's like, can we slow down a bit? 
What does that look like? How do we show up for each other? How can we be civil with each other? And um, and just go through those moments together. So I just so love how you um, work that process with us, which then only just gave so much faith and trust in how you did that for our team members across the district. So thank you all so much for that. Honestly, looking ahead, what are the future plans or next steps for the culture and employee onboarding strike team within Student Affairs? Well, I'm so glad you asked, Shasta. Oh. So um, this was really phase one of this culture conversation. Um, the next phase of it is actually filling out our culture canvas. Um, do we have a picture of that one? That's okay. Um, Y'all will see it soon enough. Um, but at the heart, literally at the heart of that culture canvas is our purpose. And all around it, it asks about things like, norms, how should meetings be conducted, um, what are our values as a student affairs team, um, and really defining out what we want this culture to be, how do we celebrate it, each other, and who's really at the center of what we do, um, which is our students. So um, in student affairs operations, we talk all the time about how do we serve those who serve our students. Um, and so it's really talking about building that particular culture of service and caring um, and what that looks like and how it feels. Um, I've heard before folks say culture is how people feel on Sunday evening before they need to show up on Monday morning. And I believe that we can co-create a culture within student affairs where people show up with excitement um, to do what they applied to do. At one point in time, folks were excited when they filled out their application uh, to come and work here. And I, I believe that we can create a culture where that excitement not just continues, but grows. Um, so with that, um, we'll be working on a template that we will be co-creating. Um, so just like we had these conversations across the district, there will be those continued conversations in building out that culture canvas. And you're a really good accountability partner. So you've told me, Anna, I need a minimum viable product of a new employee onboarding program. <laughs> and I said, all right, boss, January it is. So January, we will have our, our MVP or our minimum viable product uh, rolling out for our new employee onboarding session. Um, so hoping to post a manager um, who will be in charge of not only new employee onboarding, but also coaching and professional development. So that position should be going up soon. Uh, so be on the lookout for that if that's something that interests you. And um, I think the other thing that's really exciting is, oh, here we go. Is this, this the time now, Amitos, to do this? All right, so oh. as a symbol of um, us wanting to make sure that our employees get off on the right foot when oh. it comes to new employee onboarding, <laughs> their giveaway at that time will be socks. So I'm going to toss a couple of them out. Don't hit anybody. I won't, well, I'll hit them if they don't catch on. <laughs> so there we go. There's one. Two. I don't know go closer, do. Anna. Get three. closer to the. Three. Almost. The other side, Anna. <laughs> Thank you, Shasta. <laughs> Always coaching. Six. And. Seven. Oh, 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 she was slick with that. She was <laughs> slick with that. All right. Well, thank you. So before I let y'all off the hook, even though y'all were giving, starting people off on the right foot with those warm, fuzzy socks, <laughs> who would you like to shout out? Can I go for a shout? All right. I know we already did kind of a special shout out. But I'd like to shout out Jana. I know she's at Texan doing her whole leadership thing right now. Um, but Jana jumped on board this crazy idea with me. I said, hey, I want to do this crazy idea. And she said, let's do it. And Jana, being the amazing leader that she is, um, really pulled together an awesome train the trainer session for us. She activated us. She mobilized us. And she got this amazing motivated team led by Deidre and Jose to go out and do amazing things. Um, but she was an amazing partner in going through that certification with me and uh, making sure that everyone knew what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And she did a great job of collaborating with both Deidre and Jose, who I would also like to shout out for going along with all the crazy ideas, feedback, and things that I shared <laughs> because this was a really fun thing to do, but it took a lot. Cool. Oh, I guess it's my turn. 
Um, so in addition to Jana, I want to shout out the rest of our, of our strike team who just did, you know, like I said, 80 hours of work. Um, so that, that was Linda Terry, um, Candace Brown. Um, Ginger Bennett. Ginger, Ginger Bennett. Um, Amber Martinez Vasquez. And mm -hmm. no, I think that's about one person, one person. Um, Sir Brown Rock. Cheyenne Bryant, Thank of you. course. Oh. Of course, how could I forget? <laughs> Last but certainly not least. And um, one more shout out goes out to um, everybody who participated in these yeah. sessions. Um, y'all, y'all really brought your 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 own cultures and and you know thoughts and feelings and and everything that you needed to, to talk about and and make sure that our leadership understood. Yeah. Um, and you know, just just a little anecdote. Um, I think we were at the Round Rock campus. And we were about halfway through our session. And I mean, if you've worked at Round Rock, you know, if the wind blows in the wrong direction, the light's gonna go out. Um, so, so, um, and, and that's, just, that's, just, that's just what it is, y'all. Um, but, you know, the lights went out and I was thinking, okay, everybody's gonna wanna go, right? No, um, these people were like, no, let's, let's, let's grab the papers, let's do it on paper. We wanna keep sharing our thoughts. Oh. And so we, we stayed and we finished the session um, you know, with the emergency lights on, and then after that, we we went home. But it was it was great to have that that attitude and and that yeah. you know that really showed us. That's when we knew, like you know, y'all really wanted this from us, and and we we want to do right by you all. So we'll keep working at it, and there'll be more to come for sure. And that's um, I just want to thank all of our immediate supervisors for uh, just kind of letting us do this. Uh, having the time away from our normal uh, job responsibilities to do this extra thing um, and just believing that we can do this and that at the same time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we have a few minutes left. Are there any questions in the audience for our spotlight? Third season, first episode, there should be a question. Child are quiet. Any questions online or in the overflow? Yes. I have a question. I'm just curious if other departments want to take advantage of Morty's wonderful work, um, shoot, shoot some type of video, how would that work? Does it work? That's a great question. So we have a website, austincc.edu backslash SACOM, and that's where you can fill out the communication request and you'll see that video support service listed right there. We would love to support you. Very nice. Any other questions? They're hoping y'all ask a question because they know I have. Kelsey says, are you gonna go off cuff? And she knows I will. So I'm about to, so they're praying y'all got a question. Any other questions out there? All right, so for my very distinguished guests, one word answer, maybe two, because I'm not a rule follower either sometimes. As you think about your work and now that you're a topic of discussion, you like how I did that? Now that you're a topic of discussion. You're, you are on the table as a topic of discussion. Thank you, Sarah. What would be something that, one word or two, that you feel like your family or your friends would say about you in terms of being proud of the work that you do? Good milk. I think for, I think for me it would be dedicated. Dedicated. And dedicated to, to what I do. Very good, dedicated. So you, we have someone who can like truth check you. Like that's really, and so now I'm kind of grateful that my wife <laughs> Yeah, um, probably um, enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. Hardworking. Hardworking. Passionate. Passionate. We <laughs> can we change it? <laughs> We've already heard it, it's already out in the, those. I would say persistent. Persistent. Yeah, I could take notes. <laughs> I, I would say empathetic. Oh, that's... and I would say probably compassionate. Very nice. 
I would say all those words reflect exactly how I feel about y'all. I always share the table topics is an opportunity for me to selfishly get to know you all more and better. When we see each other in the hallway, there's not this weird, awkward, you know, um, place, but it's also, you know, an opportunity for others, you know, for when we see each other, like I saw you on, you know, table topics or, you know, I was sitting in the audience and I had a question, but I wasn't going to answer it when Shasta asked us. Um, so I wanted to ask you like, you know, offline or whatever. But for us to feel this sense of camaraderie and collegiality and being able to work with each other differently, because again, when we walk out those doors, y'all, our family and our friends, they want our time. And as much as we love and care about ACC and the students here, our family and friends deserve our time. You are so much more than the work that you do. And so getting to know the heart of you and why you love what you do, but just the background of what got you here, I think that it's important for us to all remember that because days are hard, they're long, sometimes they feel overwhelming. And sometimes when you just take a step back and just do more than just ask someone how they're doing. Let's just go walk. Mitos and I, I called her from my car and I said, hey, have you eaten? And she was like, uh-oh, she brought a notepad and everything. I was like, girl, we ain't about to work. And so, um, but it was just, hey, her, her name came up in my head. I had the free time. She had the free time. Let's just do more of that together. So. I so appreciate y'all being here, encouraging, and just being here to support your colleagues here on the stage today. And I wanna thank y'all for being here. I wanna thank you for your hard work. I wanna thank you for always raising your hand and saying, yes, we will do it, even when it's a crazy idea, but I'm gonna follow you down this road and journey. Everyone, you know, if it's a table topic, it's always gonna have food because we can't let our blood sugars um, um, fall down during lunch hour. Um, Please don't forget to nominate someone, you know, help people share their stories. And I know some people may tell you, no, do not nominate me for that because I'm not getting on that stage. Spend a little time, take them to lunch or a snack and say, it's not, it's not hard because sometimes you just want to know more about people. I would have never known that about Morty, but just the opportunity to get to understand his story says so much and we got to share it with all of y'all. So don't let that person tell you no, don't nominate me. I promise we're gonna make it easy and smooth. Our next episode is a special episode. It will be at the PBS studios on November 17, 2023. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We wanna spend a lot of time talking a little bit about how we support. Remember, Morty talked about the benefits of being a riverbat. Well, what does it mean for our students who are parents? And so PBS has done some great partnerships with ACC. So that next episode is going to be at PBS. More to come on that. But for now, y'all, we are signing off. Eat some food, dance, and have the best weekend and Friday. Take care, y'all. Bye. <laughs>